Professor Sean Anthony, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. <laughs> it's really great to have you on Exploring the Quran and the Bible. We've recorded an episode before, which everyone should watch, uh, in which we address some of your earlier work, but this is going to be a more ec epic episode. Uh, we're going to get into depth about um, your recent work, including an article on the question of whether there are missing surahs to the Quran. We're going to go in depth into Quranic studies, speak about some famous figures, uh, and also hopefully get to the question of uh, the Muhammad of history. Uh, so, yeah, really glad to have you. Yeah, have thank you. you. It's me. a pleasure yeah, to be here looking again. Looking forward yeah. to chatting. So you're a professor of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at The Ohio State uh, University. You're author of many books. Some of them are on the table before us. We're going to speak about those in a moment. But I thought we'd just get right into the article uh, that you wrote on the question of the collection of the Quran. Uh, and uh, this addresses in particular a tradition that there are certain surahs of the Qur'an. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken, they're not found in any manuscripts, mm -hmm. but certain surahs, according to literary reports, mm -hmm. that were not included in the Uthmanic codification. Mm -hmm. So before we get uh, there, uh, we might sort of step back and speak about the codification of the so Qur'an. So can you give us sort of a rundown of the mm -hmm. traditional account of the co codification of the Qur'an mm -hmm. by the Caliph Uthman? Yeah. Um, so according to traditional story, uh, the Caliph Uthman uh, initiates the official or caliphal codification of the Qur'an. There were other collections before that that were undertaken by companions of the Prophet for their own personal use, um, most famously even by some of the Caliphs themselves. Uh, the first initiative was by uh, Abu Bakr and Omar. Uh, as far as we know, that's only supposed to be one single copy. It serves as the basis for Uthman's copy. Right. Um, but Uthman, he's the one that's responsible for uh, the Qur'an according to the parameters that we have it today. This number of surahs that we have, the orders of the surahs, uh, not necessarily the numbering of the verses, but more, but more or less the, the basic consonantal text he's responsible for. He did that in Medina with a coterie of scribes and then subsequently sent them to kind of the major centers of the empire at the time, so mostly Iraq and Syria. Um, so that's the basic codification. Happens probably around 650, if, we, if the counts are to be believed. Um, when it comes to the literary accounts and the literary descriptions of um, how the codification took place, there are, are all sorts of stories about things that are included or excluded, things okay. that are okay. lost. Um, Oh, and um, can, can I jump in before yeah, yeah. we get to the specific question yeah. of potentially missing surahs yeah. of the Quran yeah. on the Uthmanic codification? There have been there's a whole history of controversy over yeah. the reliability of this yeah. story. So mm -hmm. um, I think as early as sort of the seminal work in Quranic mm -hmm. studies, Nodaka, and then uh, Shfali in mm -hmm. Volume Two of the History of the mm -hmm. Quran, uh, had some questions about the reliability of the story. Mm -hmm both kind of phase one, mm -hmm. the Abu Bakr mm -hmm. collection. Uh, I think he, he questioned, mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, Shfali in particular, who wrote volume two of History of the Quran, this tradition that a number of the men who had memorized the Quran had actually been martyred or mm -hmm. killed, and therefore there was urgency to the yeah. project. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, there are questions around uh, Uthman's project as well. Could you sort of um, just uh, bring us up to date on the assessment of the reliability of the yeah. story. Do you consider it reliable? Mm -hmm. Do you think Uthman actually historically is the one who put the basic text of the Quran together yeah. as we know it? Yeah. So the account that I just gave in broad outline, um, we essentially have a good idea of who it came from and who composed it. And that's the, the kind of the systematic account that takes Abu Bakr discussing with Omar, we need to collect the Quran because people are being martyred fighting against this other false prophet, Musaylama. Musaylama, right. Um, yeah. And then that material after Omar is assassinated by an enslaved person is inherited by his daughter, Hafsa, the uh, uh, widow of the prophet. And then Hafsa gives this... Um, well, it's described in many ways, either a mushaf or a series of scrolls or whatever, to Uthman to serve as the base text for his codification project. Right, right. Like, all that story, from the Abu Bakr, the Omar, the Hafsa, the Uthman, appears in one very long narrative. 
uh, attributed to a very important uh, uh, Medinan scholar of the Umayyad period named Ibn Shahab Zuhri. And so he dies in 742, if memory serves me correctly. Um, and almost the, it's, it's hard to kind of overstate his importance for um, early Arabic historiography and also for giving a shape and form to, um, I would say in particular, what becomes Sunni historiographical memory as we know it today. So I think that the idea that Ibn Shahab Zuhri is responsible for this story uh, and that it was transmitted to his students and is preserved relatively faithfully. Uh, the earliest work, if, if, I could, if I could remember, I think the earliest work in which that account appears is called Fada al Quran uh, okay. by Abu Ubaid al Qasim ibn Salam. Um, but in any case, um, that is probably his account. Zuhri's Riyaya. account. So okay. we're talking okay. about an early Marwanid era. Kind of account probably okay. was first articulated in the 690s or 700 something like that um great it's early um okay. so is is okay. it accurate um I, it definitely has tendentious aspects when you drill down on the details um aspects that um seem to be just a byproduct of how stories are told right um top boy and things like this uh it also has some other interesting comments that seem to be actually well informed, for example, it's comments about uh, the orthography of how you write uh, a word in Arabic, tabut, which is like basically arc or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's a literary account at the end of the day. Uh, what so about, for example, I remember, uh, I don't know if this is Charlie, but mm -hmm. I remember the accusation that, well, in the story uh, about uh, Uthman's mm -hmm. work, his project, mm -hmm. sort of the key or turning point is this general Hudayfa shows up and mm -hmm. he says, well, the Syrians yeah. and the Iraqis are fighting over the pronunciation yeah. of the Quran. Yeah. And the criticism of the reliability of that account is, well, but the so-called Uthmanic text is basically just a rasm. Yeah. So it's just a consonantal text. So it wouldn't actually solve the problem <laughs> of pronouncing the text because yeah. you can't pronounce the text text based on the Rasam itself. Yeah, yeah. So that Hudayfa story is in the, that's the Zuhri account. So okay. Um, okay. I think one of the major questions relates to um, what is, the assumption is what the Rasam is supposed to do. Is it supposed to codify a certain dialect? Is it supposed to codify a certain way of pronounce, pronouncing and reciting the Quran per se? Okay. I don't think that's what it means. Um, so I think really what, what we're talking about is trying to impose some sort of more regularized codification of, of the ordering of the words and the actual text itself as restrained by a consonantal text. Yes. So the real codification is not to codify one um, dialect over the other per se, uh, but rather to restrict the amount of play that you have in the transmission of the text. There's still a relatively large amount because you, when you only stick to the consonantal text, uh, but I think that part of that regulation okay. happens with okay. oral transmission of the Quran as well. So you have an oral tradition that is constrained, kind of put in sort of a, a what's the right word? Not a straight jacket, but yeah, whatever, yeah. handcuffed or whatever. limits captured, by yeah, the rasm. By, by only the so rasm far itself. you can go. Okay. Um, so and the thing is, there's all sorts of like technical terms that tend to change or, or shift between the versions of the, uh, uh, of the accounts, and they may or may, may or may not be synonymous. Like there's a lot of hand wringing about which luha it is in. So what's luha here? It's probably some sort of linguistic practice. Um, also, what is a harf? Right, the harf could be little kind of means letter or whatever, but does it mean? Uh, a mode of of recitation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. a style, um, all sorts of things. Like these are kind of very technical questions that okay. that really linguists. Um, get into okay, more than a couple that. other questions, yeah. be, and we will get on to this yeah. uh, 2016 article in a second. Yeah. But one is uh, on the flip side, mm -hmm. those who sort of like the uh, tradition, or mm -hmm. at least are optimistic about the historical reliability of the Uthman story would say, well, look at the manuscript evidence, basically, mm -hmm. with one big exception, which yeah. we'll get to probably eventually, but basically, uh, the manuscript tradition is all bas basically one consonantal text. Yeah. 
Uh, so we've got the different early manuscripts, mm. usually called Hejazi, it's all, all one. And um, the lack of variation to that continental text suggests there was like a top-down project, mm. like uh, some sort of state apparatus. Mm. Why not a caliph like Uthman, yeah. who could actually, you know, through this apparatus, you could enforce uniformity in the continental text. Yeah. So that's like a telltale sign mm. that there was this government project. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think of that argument? Yeah, I think the material evidence strongly suggests that if there was a project in the middle of the seventh century, it was successful. Okay. And one thing that's striking about it is, so what we can do is we can divide all of our earliest manuscripts before we even get to any sort of radio dating or whatever, we can divide them according to the paleographic style. Okay. All right. Okay. So the earliest we call Hejazi by convention, but then you get the Kufic and then you get the different divisions of Kufic and so on and so forth. And so we have what we think is a pretty good sort of chronology of how the Arabic script evolves. And we can match that chronology to not just Quranic manuscripts, but we can match it to epigraphy, Arabic epigraphy, which is growing in terms of its size and corpus, <laughs> mm -hmm. and is, was already substantial uh, at the time that this paleographic uh, scheme was developed, primarily by François de Roche. Um, and then we can also compare it to what we find in the papyri as well. So papyri are these kind of sheets of, uh, of plant paper, essentially, that survive from Egypt, mostly administrative. We have a lot of them from Arab in Arabic as well as Greek and Coptic and okay, stuff like that. Okay. So we can compare them and track them like that. Um, and what we find is at each layer of that kind of pale paleographic scheme, we have the same text type. That is, it's a codified text, right? Uh, there's that one, one example uh, that is the great exception. That's the Sana'a one. Uh, but even that does not uh, vary in, ex in, in extreme amounts. Um, but it's regular across that uh, that entire sweep of kind of the paleographic evolution of the okay. Arabic language, okay. Okay. and I think that's that's a very compelling argument. And then you add on to that um, recent radiocarbon dating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that more or less confirms that uh, our paleographic scheme is correct, like the order that we've kind of put the, the Hejazi manuscripts yeah, are older than yeah, exactly, the Kufic, than the Kufic ones and yeah. so on and so forth. I mean, you can already see this, uh, by the way, in the fact if you look at the inscriptions on the Dome of the Rock and the the, the famous inscriptions on the uh, the uh, the inner and outer arcade, um, those are already way beyond Hejazi style. Okay. Those are, we already got Kufic okay. at that moment. Um, so it seems that yeah, it has, it has a lot of uh, a lot of heft and, and weight behind it, and and what we have learned with the radiocarbon dating is kind of just gravy. It's it's it more or less confirms what we've from the, been, been finding already through from the study of the scripts. Analysis. Okay, yeah. okay. One more sort of specific question about the Uthman codification mm -hmm. story. Uh, you mentioned Hafsa. Mm -hmm. So uh, these sheets collected by Abu Bakr go mm -hmm. to Omar and then to his daughter. Yeah. Uh, Hafsa, by tradition, yeah. uh, she stores them according to one tradition under her bed. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was an article that you responded to. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> about the idea that Hafsa uh, was an editor of the Quran. Yeah. I think that's the term yeah, that the original yeah, article yeah. used and you responded to. Um, and if I understand sort of the vibe of that article correctly, it was a way of sort of um, arguing for the, you know, a woman having, mm -hmm. you know, some sort of role in the codification of mm -hmm. the Quran. Um, so, but you say, I mean, maybe, unfortunately, mm -hmm. I don't know how yeah. to place a value yeah. judgment on this, yeah. that uh, this is not the right way to think of Hafsa. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't think there's enough evidence for, to say that she was an editor of the Quran or, or, um, had a editorial role in the Uthmanic project. Um, you know, but one of the things that is interesting about the stories about the, the prophet's wives and the relationship to the codex of the Quran, the earliest codices, is they're usually, they usually are said to have their own codices. And they do contain variant readings of certain verses and things like this. And this is recorded in literary sources. Uh, unfortunately, the evidence for this does not appear anywhere, as far as I know, in our earliest manuscripts. This is a continual problem, which we'll return to. Um, but, you know, one thing that's that, that is striking about these accounts of the uh, of the prophet's wives is number one they're literate. 
Uh, and number two, they have a desire to have a, a mushaf of their own. So they follow the same pattern as other companions of owning their own private copies of the Quran. And in one of the really interesting things that occur in a lot of these accounts about the courtesies of the Prophet's wives is uh, sometimes their scribes are named, and their scribes okay. are said to okay. be Christians, like Arabic-speaking Christians from okay. Iraq, uh, which is really fascinating. And so um, an art historian by the name of Alain Georges, who's at uh, Oxford, he wrote a very interesting um, a book on the paleography of the Quran and things like this. And one of the things that he noticed, uh, and I found very compelling, is that if you look at the format and the shape of a lot of our early mushafs, they seem to be um, just in their basic design, and really even the idea that you put it in a mushaf that is a bound kind of codex, right, right. Uh, to be relying upon and to be reproducing a lot of the book uh, making techniques of late ancient Christian scribal culture. Okay. Uh, okay. And so there seems to be some material uh, confirmation behind that idea too. So, um, and not too quick to, to throw away those accounts and or even to diminish their importance of, uh, of the accounts of the, um, of the, the codices of the prophets wise because of just those little things that you pick up from yeah. them. Yeah. Okay, so according to the traditional story, uh, Uthman was not the first mm -hmm. to collect the Quran. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we usually say collect. I think Jama is used. Yeah, Jama. In, it can mean two Arabic. things. Is the problem? It can mean either to memorize the Quran in its total, Jama, or it can mean okay. to make your own copy of the make Quran your own copy. Well. So uh, there's been, you know, a fair bit of, of work on this, but nevertheless, we should sort of uh, revisit this question of the so-called companion codices. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and in some ways, according to the story, uh, it, the companion codices were, in a way, the problem that prompted. I mean, there's a story of the Syrian Iraqi soldiers fighting over the pronunciation yeah. of the text, but if I remember from, I guess, Zuhuni's account, mm -hmm. Hudayfa also says something like, uh, get us one mushaf before our community is divided as the Jews and the Christians Christian, are divided. Yeah. Is that right? Is yeah, that in that's there? correct, yeah. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, and why would the community be divided? Um, I mean, following the logic of the story as I see it, well, because there are various mushafs out there. Uh, again, I mean, we don't really have evidence for this, mm -hmm. except that we really should speak about the Sena manuscript, maybe the Sena manuscript. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that uh, early companions, all sort of you know, faithful Muslims, um, some of them really prominent, like Ibn Mas'ud, mm -hmm. the very important companion of the Prophet, uh, they had their own codices. So most, you know, the, the ones you hear about the most are Ibn Mas'ud mm -hmm. and Ubay. Uh, but even, I think, Ali ibn Abi Talib is said to have a mushaf in yeah. certain traditions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, am I describing this right? Uh, why is this? They're just companions mm -hmm. just for personal piety, mm -hmm. want to have their own set of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a written record of the Quran? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so you have tons of, of companions ostensibly that have their own codices. And a lot of these persons, you have to remember, too, have kind of left Medina at this point, and they've kind of been scattered to the winds. Like Ibn Masud famously goes to Kufa, and he has like his circle of students around him in Kufa and things like this. Uh, and so part of the issue is um, how does Islam and its teachings, and especially in scripture, remain intact and remain pres preserved uh, right. in the wake of this massive upheaval that is the Islamic conquest that spreads this, this early core kernel of the community, these Medinans, really as far as they're concerned, to the four corners of the earth, right? Um, and so the process of doing this ostensibly uh, was already undertaken at people's own initiative. Um, and the, the differences that arise are interesting. Probably our presentation of these differences um, or a combination of, of perhaps um, real knowledge about what particular, in particular, Ibn Masud's codex said, as opposed to the Uthmanic codex, um, combined with kind of schematic um, kind of narratives about their differences. So how real or, or sort of contrived some of these uh, ostensible differences are is sometimes very difficult to gauge because we're not dealing with material evidence, right? Yeah, and we so do with stories sometimes you know, what the, 
the difference is can can differ from narrative to narrative, right? I just yeah. thought of a, yeah. I mean, an example that could lead one to believe mm -hmm. that some of this stuff is made up. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, in I think sort of sort of the Hud, uh, the eleventh chapter of the Quran. Uh, there's a story of the three visitors, I think in this passage yeah. are called Rasul, coming to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a passage where it says, and his wife was standing. Imra mm -hmm. atahu And then there's a remark that, uh, in some of the tafsirs, there's a remark that says, and fi mushaf uh, ibn Mas'ud, uh, Wahua Jalisun or Wahua Qaidun. I think both are actually yeah. um, offered in different tafsirs as options. So, which means, and he was sitting. Yeah. So, I mean, that seems like an almost like an exegetical yeah. uh, comment. Yeah. Um, and uh, because it would sort of, I don't know, you just think the way that the interpreter's mind works. The text says she was standing. And so um, you just sort of say, like, why does the text not say what he was doing? Was yeah. he standing or sitting? Oh, actually, in Ibn Mas'ud's yeah. Mus'haf, it says he was sitting. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, is that all, uh, is, is it all like that? Yeah. Where sort of made up anecdotes, imagining what another Mus'haf yeah. might have yeah. said? Yeah, I, I don't think they all are. Like, the one that always sticks out in my mind, too, is like, is... Al-Ahzab is supposedly like even longer or maybe just as long as Baqarah. I can't remember yeah, the exact wording. Yeah, uh, it's 33 maybe. Or yeah, 33. and so like, but it was lost or whatever. And usually it's it's lost to, in Yemen with this, among these guys that were killed fighting Musaylim or something like this. You mean the parts of Ahzab? Yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of times okay. these because seem, it was as long as sort of two yeah, as yeah. in Baqarah. Um, okay. And so these stories, I, I don't know. It, it's hard to put a lot of credibility to them. Um, but... There are some so sort of, of the task is sorry, to yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, to uh, be sort of uh, I don't know um, simplistic about it, the question is, can you sort through these yeah. traditions and actually get authentic historical information about yeah. what Ibn Masoud's Mushaf said, yeah. for example, or Obeys? Yeah. Or uh, is it all just a creation yeah. retrojection? Mm -hmm. Is there a core there? Yeah. So I think there is a core. Um, and so especially with Ibn Masud, like if you look at um, Al Faraz's work and things like that, you you can get to it, right? Okay. It would be nice if we had an actual um, manuscript. Manuscript. Yeah. I mean, one of the interesting things about the Sena One palimpsest is the possibility that it might be an unidentified companion uh, uh, codex, which I think is is very intriguing. It does look like that, so maybe we do have one. Um, but returning to the, the literary material. Uh, this is more kind of what I wanted to do in the article, because uh, it seems like a really good instance to to test or at least examine uh, some of the claims of the literary sources for which we have no hard evidence in, in terms of the manuscript evidence for its claims, right? Uh, but it makes some very bold macro claims that you can sort of test. So those macro claims are, are simply this, that there are five kind of controversial surahs about whether or not they belong right. to right. the Quran. And these are uh, Fatiha and what's called Al Mu'adhatani. The, what would um, that's the uh, that's a nas and falak. Um, and then these two surahs of Ubay. Mm -hmm. And so Khala and Haft. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And so, in the story, and you can see how it's it's set up in literary terms. Uh, Ibn Masud's codex excludes all five, right? So Fatiha for Ibn. Uh, yeah. And Masood is not a part of it. So is the Ma'ad I mean, Ma the Tainer is I, not part of it. Like, I just feel like we should dwell on that for a <laughs> yeah, second. Because, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, it's not really, uh, maybe it is controversial, but yeah. it's not coming from outside of the tradition. No, I mean, these yeah. are pious Muslim authors yeah. who say Ibn Masood he had a codex, yeah. and it was missing the first yeah. surah or chapter of the Quran yeah. and the last two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So sort of one, 113, 114, yeah. they just, they weren't there in his version. Of yeah. That. And it's not, and for him, it's not like he rejected their existence outright. It's like, these are just prayers, right? These are okay. things the ta okay. prophet taught, et cetera. Which could make sense because yeah. Al-Fatiha, I mean, especially the, the second part of Al-Fatiha, yeah. you know, so that section uh, is, seems to be like a prayer. It's, a, yeah. it's an address to, to God, an yeah. invocation of God. Yeah, so. yeah. And so... This, yeah, so it's not like he did deny their existence. And also, sorry. Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> but also, al-Falaq 
and yeah. an nas yeah. it has the qul at the yeah, beginning exactly uh, but then it's a'udhu bi rabbil falaq or a'udhu bi rabbil nas so yeah. it se- they also seem to be invocations yeah anyway yeah so they they all follow this prayer formula which is yeah. which is yeah. also interesting um and so obey on the on the other hand he does all five plus his two extra ones that I that I wrote on that article okay can i just so, yeah, 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 yeah. Make, make this clear so yeah. we're speaking about uh I don't know. In one manner of speaking, five uh, controversial, not controversial, five, um, I don't know, questionable or... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, five, I would say five prayers, contested. three of which are agreed to be uh, surahs, surahs, two of which don't ever attain that status, okay. except in Ubay's Codex. Okay. Right? And so the literary aspect, as far as I, I'm concerned, is so Ibn Masud goes too far by rejecting all five. Ubay goes too far by rejecting all, uh, sorry, by accepting all five. And then Othman's codex is supposed to be, in the literary account, like the golden mean, by accepting okay. three okay. out of the five. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of how they're, they're counter. So that's a way of, another. is that a way of sort of reassuring the Muslim reader that Othman's the right codex, decision was made, yeah. Because it's neither the extreme mm-hmm. of uh, Ibn Masud of rejecting yeah. uh, all five yeah. or the extreme of uh, Ubay yeah. of including all five, yeah. but it's including three and excluding yeah. two. Yeah, and okay. there's all sorts of things that are done to make arguments for, in the literary sources, the codex of, of Othman, right? And so uh, in favor of those of Ubay, who is an Ansari from Medina, from okay. Medina, and Ibn Masud, who was not Quraysh, he was Hudali, he was from the tribe of Hudayl, uh, but he was himself Meccan. And so what they'll say is Ubay, you know, he is a Medinan, and so he doesn't have the right um, register or of some sort. Um, he is not Quraysh, and so his Arabic is not quite correct. And the same thing with Ibn Masud, he's um, from the Banu Hudayl, and so he doesn't quite merit uh, uh, the same praise as someone from Quraysh, right? And so, ostensibly, even though Uthman's Codex is copied down by a uh, scribe from the Ansar, this is Z- Zayd ibn um, the people that kind of recite the Quran and are giving the text of the Quran are, are a, um, uh, a gathering of Quraysh. So, Make of that what you will. Um, that I find that to be very tendentious, but that's just one of the ways in which arguments are made with inside the literary sources in favor of Uthman's codex. Because right? clearly, that's something you have to argue for. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, especially I've because s- Obey ibn Mas'ud were highly praised as for their knowledge of the Quran. Like Obey was called Sayyid al Quran, so he's like the master lector of the Quran. The master of the readers yeah. and the lectors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you would think if you're in the Middle, middle Ages and uh, you're in a very sectarian uh, environment, mm-hmm. uh, there are Christians and Jews who are rejecting, mm-hmm. by the fact that they remain Christians and Jews, rejecting mm-hmm. Islamic claims to Muhammad's prophethood mm-hmm. uh, and presumably rejecting the Quran as divine revelation. So there's all this pressure on you. You sort of, you're aware of these Jews and Christians around. Uh, there's all this pressure to, you know, insist on this, both the prophet of Muhammad and the validity of the Quran. But there's sort of two claims you have to make, it seems to me. Uh, one being that uh, the text, you know, Muhammad heard from an angel, heard from God, but then also that the project of codification was, um, validly done. I mean, Mm -hmm. Uthman wasn't a prophet, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's a big, I mean, that's sort of like almost equally important. So there's a genre of literature, Mm -hmm. Dala'il and Nabuwa. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of one task that Muslims attend to. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have to prove Muhammad really was a prophet. But isn't that almost as important for apologetic means that you defend Mm -hmm. Uthman? And Mm -hmm. it's even more maybe complicated by the fact that Uthman's legacy, I mean, he's a rightly guided caliph. Yeah. But it's kind of problematic. Yeah, it's mixed. Um, so it, it takes a while for him to become a rightly guided caliph. Um, uh, so I'm trying to think about how deep to get into that one. Um, but yeah, so the 
the famous thing to know about Uthman is that he reigns for 12 years. Right, six, 644 to 656, yeah. right. And that the, usually these are divided into six good years and okay. six bad years. Okay. okay, And the six bad years culminate in his assassination at the hands of Muslims this time. Uh, the, the second caliph, he was assassinated too, but he was assassinated by uh, an enslaved man, probably a Persian by the name of Abu Lu'a. Um, in any case, so Uthman's assassination was extremely traumatic, um, and it still remains a, a kind of a major point of trauma in, in Muslim historical memory. Um, and in essence, the dynasty that arise, the dynasty of caliphs that arises in the wake of that, the Umayyads, uh, they rise to power by claiming that they are sort of the rightful heirs to Uthman's legacy and that because he was wrongly killed and wrongly murdered, uh, that was the justification for uh, the caliphate falling to yes. um, his next in line in Kenya, which is a guy named Muawiyah Ma Ma Sufyan. From Damascus, uh, yes. Yeah. And so Uthman and the idea of him being one, a righteous caliph, and two, his caliphate um, having policies that were inherently good and not bad and not worthy of assassination, and three, that his assassination was a gross moral wrong, yes. were all pillars of Umayyad political ideology. Okay, right. okay. Um, okay. So yeah. uh, we should think of Uthman yeah. maybe as the first Umayyad. Yeah, uh, I do. A lot of, not a lot of people like that idea. Okay. And okay. the reason goes to back to the idea, uh, this is very uh, common in Sunni uh, historiography, is that um, in essence, once Muawiyah comes into power, the caliphate stops being kind of this uh, utopian ideal. It devolves into kingship. Okay, right? okay. Um, that's all right if you want to view it that way. I, I don't find that necessarily very helpful uh, from a more secular uh, historical view, but it's very important to know uh, the ideologies behind historical memory that are at work in early Arabic historiography as well, too. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, yes, he's the first Umayyad Caliph, uh, Uthman is. Uh, okay, okay. And on these uh, surahs uh, that were by certain literary accounts yeah. uh, in Ubay's uh, Mus'haf, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Khala and Haft, um, they are uh, khala meaning denouncing, uh, haft meaning serving, mm -hmm. something like serving. Um, you know, they are, uh, they're, you know, in your article you include the text, both the Arabic and the translation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, they have Quranic flavor, it mm -hmm. seems. I mean, is that your assessment? They yeah, rhyme, they, they rhyme, they rhyme rhyme, and... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, the thing is, you can pick at them and, and find anomalies in them. Okay. Um, but, and this point was made by Noliki long ago, but the same sort of anomalies that you can pick at apply to also the other three of the five. Okay. So, Fatiha, the Mu'adhatani, Falaq al Nas. Because there's sort of prayer like invocations. Yeah. That... And the, yeah. So I'm, so, I'm not 100% all in on the idea that they actually do belong to the Quranic corpus myself. Um, but to me, they would be just as much as open, just as much doubtful. But as, how does a historian? How does a historian yeah, exactly. answer that know. question? Exactly. I, oh, to me, like ultimately, what is that, I don't what is, know. For you as a historian, what yeah. does it mean? What does the Quranic corpus mean? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for, in one sense, and this is what I try to get to a bit in the article. Okay. And in one sense, the Quranic corpus is the thing that survives in kind of the written manuscript record that we can kind of okay. access and okay. determine and okay. transmit it as such. So that's one way of thinking about codification and canonization. Um, on the other hand, um, the Quran was not codified and canonized merely by being written down, but it was also codified and can canonized through ritual, through ritual prayer. And this is where uh, the two surahs of Ubay, in my view at least, if they were not included in the, in the Mus'haf, they were canonized as a part of uh, Muslim ritual prayer, mm -hmm. right? especially as the Qunut prayers. Mm -hmm. And so, in one sense, they are canonized as part of the corpus of revealed things uh, that um, the Prophet Muhammad passed on to the community. Okay. And insofar as they were prayed, as Quran, as they were prayed as surahs recited in the course of ritual prayers, 
and this is very well documented, I think, I, I find this to be more or less beyond doubt, uh, then yeah, they are part of the Quranic corpus. So when you recite prayers and you say, I'm reciting a surah, and you call it particularly a surah, um, then to me, okay. that's part of the, the ritual corpus of, of the Quran. Um, and if you're calling something that you're reciting as part of your prayers a surah, um, which is, means a chapter, but they, I, I don't think, I looked for this, I didn't find anything else, if someone knows, please contact me, um, anything else in the whole kind of, uh, um, kind of Arabic literary religious tradition that's called a surah that's not part of the Quran. To call something a surah is a very uh, specific right, right. term of art. So they're not called uh, hadith qudsi or yeah, uh, no. something else. Sometimes they, they are called like just qunut and it's like a, a special type of prayer, right? So, okay. um, but they are called like yeah. the suratain or suratain, the two surahs. And you have okay. very explicit examples where people say, I was praying behind so and so, and he, and he, recited these two prayers as part of his salat, as part of his ritual prayers. Yes. Um, and so you have this with Omar, you have this with other prominent figures and, and things like this. And so in the article, I try to um, pull together all the examples that we have of that. Okay. Um, okay. And so, and also highlight that um, the canonization of the Quran and its codification happens through like two means, right? Not just through what we have written down, but also through Kind of Muslim ritual. Isn't practice. it analogous though to abrogated material in a sense? Yeah, so a lot because of times it is there material, isn't there a category mm -hmm. of texts mm -hmm. the recitation of which was abrogated, mm -hmm. but there's still somehow valid Quran? Yeah, so there's things where you have, for example, a, uh, a ruling that is considered to be valid, like the stoning of, ad of adulterers, married right, adulterers. Right, that's the famous one. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the text is abrogated. It's not recited. It's not, yeah. We don't even know where, theoretically, it would belong in the Quran. Yeah. Um, even though you can find examples where people say where it belongs. Um, but this is a little bit differently insofar as it, it's, it's erased from the text, right, from the Mus'haf itself. But, but the still idea recited. is preserved in the heart. Right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's like okay. interesting. It, it's um, and I think there's there's one scholar. I think it's Muhasabi that says this in particular, uh, that that's how it's preserved. It's it's an aspect of the Quranic revelation that is preserved through memory, but not through um, the written okay. text. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, in in the course of our chatting about uh, the question mm -hmm. of Ubay and Ibn Masoud. Um, we mentioned that the consonantal, the record of the consonantal text yeah. in manuscripts is basically consistent. Uh, and then there's this one glaring exception, mm -hmm. which is this one manuscript that was found. Uh, I think you called it Sena'a 1. Is yeah, this yeah. the standard way? Yeah. Uh, it's a little complicated because yeah. it was first studied by a couple of Germans, including Gerd Puin, yeah. who had DAM or something. They yeah. had their own way of referring to yeah. it. Yeah, it's Dara Mokhtutat. Yeah, so it's- Oh, it's, that was Dara yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the yeah. House of the Manuscripts. Yeah, yeah. Well. and then for whatever reason, it was studied again, um, and uh, by Behnam Sadegi, yeah. uh, also Asma Halali, I think, yeah. studied it. And anyway, yeah. let's call it Sana'a one. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the extraordinary thing about this manuscript is that it doesn't follow the consonantal text yeah. as we know it from the so-called Uthmanic mm -hmm. consonantal text. Um, yeah, and I think you uh, sort of uh, saw that as, uh, or at least you raised the possibility that maybe this was a companion text. Mm -hmm. So um, I have some sort of questions about that because mm -hmm. uh, we have this, these literary reports that there were companions of the Prophet who had their own text. We've been speaking about that, mm -hmm. Masoud and Ubay. And then we have this actual piece of physical evidence, a document, yeah. which does have uh, variants that go beyond variants of the vowels mm -hmm. or the dotting. Mm -hmm. So what would be permitted according to the idea of uh, canonical qira'at mm -hmm. or readings. So it has significant variants, but it doesn't match Ubay's text, mm -hmm. the reports of Ubay's text, yeah. and it doesn't match the reports of Ibn Masoud's yeah. text. So, um, I mean, is it just, I, I almost feel like it's just throwing your hands up, oh, it's some unknown companion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. What do you think about that? Um, I think it's a good way of understanding it. I mean, that thesis originally is Behnam Sadegi's thesis, that mm -hmm. it's a, potentially a companion codex. Um, I think oh, another way of just calling it a companion codex is just saying it, it does not 
adhere to the to the automatic text type. So it's just a different text type. Okay. Um, so it's Harry Potter printed in England as opposed to Harry Potter printed in, in America. I right? don't know. They're different. So that, so Are they different? A, so there's the, the first spelling? one. Yeah. So uh, hopefully I get this right. <laughs> so the first book is called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone okay. in the UK. Okay. But it's called Harry Potter and the, and the Sorcerer's, Sorcerer's Stone, Stone in yeah. the United States because yeah. we don't associate philosophers with sorcery in American English, I guess. Okay. So okay. It, to me, it's a bit like that. All right. So it's just important enough that it's a different text type. All right. Um, and the fact that it is an underlayer on top of which a Othmanic which we haven't mentioned. Type yeah, so was, it's was a written. Yes. It, I think, and it's extremely early radiocarbon dating of the uh, underlying parchment, the material, I think is strongly suggestive that it's a pre automatic type. Um, but So um, just, just to be clear yeah. for everyone, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a really important point. Yeah. So this manuscript is a palimpsest, so it yeah. has a layer uh, that was an earlier layer, uh, that's uh, the lower layer, mm -hmm. which was erased. Yeah. Um, that is the non Uthmanic text yeah. type. And then uh, an upper layer, which yeah. follows the Uthmanic text type, yeah. which was written above it. But we, through different technologies, were able to recapture that lower layer. Yeah. And that's where we find the variants. Somewhat. <laughs> yeah. okay. I mean, it's very hard to read. Uh, but, like, yeah, I think the old pictures we have are ultraviolet. Um, okay. There's even more, actually, that we haven't done this with. Okay. Uh, so there's a okay. whole kind of set of more leaves that have not even in, been analyzed. In Yemen, in yes, Sena. Yeah. Okay. So in any case. Were you, you were, did you spend time in Yemen? I did, but I, I was too young and too dumb to have anything <laughs> okay. to do with this stuff. Okay. <laughs> okay you weren't, <laughs> yeah, you weren't yeah. in Dada yeah, yeah. No, no. Okay. I, I, w I was interviewed by John Walker Lynn's lawyers, though, which is another story, if you remember okay. who he is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the American Taliban guy. Uh, but in any case, um, <laughs> what was I saying? Oh, so, sorry, sorry. yeah. So, and the other thing to, to uh, I think keep in mind too is that the what is in the Sena on the lower text, it's not so radically different, right? So it's not like we have an extra sura in there or, or anything like that. It is the sort of differences in wording, both deletions and additions yes, yes. that we find being described and attributed to companion codexes, codices. And also, what it differs from the Othmanic text type from, and this is the, the easiest thing to see, is something that's called the ta'lif. And so this is the order of the surahs. So, yes. is, is it Fatiha, Baqara, you know, and so on and right. so forth. I don't know. Um, it's a different order, right? And so that's somewhat prom. It's, I mean, it's, it seems like a nothing burger if uh, like you're, you're, you're looking for something big. But for codicologists and people that are interested in textual history, this is really important, right? Oh, they're totally rearranging how they order things. And it does, and the fact that that is so rare also tells us something, I think, about the authority and the staying power of the canonization that we see uh, in the Othmanic text type. Yeah, like, why not just rearrange the source? Who cares? You know, like, what, what difference is it? But it, it's extremely rare to find something like that. Right. Um, you know. Yeah, and that it was erased, yeah. and it yeah, wasn't exactly. like uh, poetry or a tax document was written yeah. on top of it, yeah. but the, the standard text was written mm -hmm. on top of it. Yeah. Seems to tell us something. Yeah, and you know, I think a common misconception, is, too, is that uh, most people have heard of like the famous thing where Othman burns the old codices. Yes, but yes. Many of the early uh, uh, accounts, too, they speak not only just of burning, but they also speak of erasing, and they also speak of tearing in the bits as well. So, uh, Do you think that's true of that story? That he burned um, these variants? That he burned it? Or tore, tore into bits? Or? Yeah. So the, the one thing that makes me... So, of course, something happened to, to these old Qurans. Who knows what happened to these old Qurans? Yeah. The things that makes me a, a little bit inclined to believe it is the case is it became an object of uh, sectarian polemic. So one of the nasty things that was said about Uthman is that he was haraq al-masahif, which means like the okay. mushaf or the codex incinerator. And so where many people ejected... These are Shiite sources? Yeah, these are mostly Sanders? Shiite sources. Okay. Um, and were, they object very strongly to his action of, of doing that um, and, and portray it as uh, kind of sacrilege, right? And so it seems to me that... The Shiite sources at least suggest that it 
having that account opened up Othman to criticism. Um, and that's not something that necessarily the Umayyads would, would have welcomed uh, or whoever is writing the account mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and, you know, who knows? But uh, to me, it seems like uh, that at least lends some credence to it. Right, you know? right. Okay, okay. Uh, one last thing on the Sena a bit, and then we'll, we'll move on to a totally, totally radically different topic yeah. about uh, contemporary scholars and chronic studies. Uh, I just uh, sort of want to, um, uh, I don't know, at least interrogate a bit the mode of thinking about uh, the Othmanic text. I mean, we've even been using this phrase, Othmanic mm -hmm. text type, yeah. um, companion codis, codex for Sena. Um, I just have this impression, maybe I'm too skeptical, mm. that um, we are limiting the possible options for historical argument by sort of taking this kind of format, mm -hmm. uh, including the terms and the personalities that we find in the mostly Abbasid accounts, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit earlier, maybe yeah. some Ramayid accounts, um, about the collection of the Quran, and using that as 21st century scholars mm. Um, to explain, for example, uh, differences within the manuscripts. I mean, why not just think of the Sena manuscript, for example, as an earlier text type, mm -hmm. uh, which instead of being a deviation somehow mm -hmm. from the Qur'an, yeah. I mean, maybe uh, this is a caricature, and you can correct mm -hmm. me, uh, simply as a more ancient witness mm -hmm. to what the Qur'an looked like. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's kind of what it is, to be perfectly honest. Um, okay. So, I mean, we could use that language. Like, I think that, like, if we were going to do, like, a... Can I just explain a yeah. little bit more? Yeah. Because I think the assumption, when we call that the Codex of an Unknown Companion, the assumption a lot of people have is mm. Uthman got it right. Mm. He preserved, probably yeah. verbatim, how Muhammad himself yeah. pronounced the Quran. Mm. And some other companions got it wrong, which is why their yeah. codices were destroyed. Mm -hmm. So the Sena manuscript is one of those companion codis codices that was wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it doesn't actually help us understand the Quran better as historians. Yeah. Now, you know, a believer theologically yeah. will have a different approach, but mm -hmm. just as historians. Yeah. Um, no, I 100% agree that to me, like the. Uh, so the, the Sena, the undertext of the Sena pound test, unfortunately, is not complete in any way. And okay. even the stuff that we do have, okay. sometimes it's very difficult to decipher what's there, right? Just because you can bring out some of the text doesn't mean that you can bring out all of the text. Um, but with that being said, yeah, uh, to me, I think the Sena palimpsest is just as likely to represent the the ancient, the what was the, like the German thing, the Ur Quran, right? Like, <laughs> like the 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 uh, the or the Quran is in its more primeval state, okay. just just as okay. much as the Othmanic can. Like, I don't think the Othmanic text is based upon the Sena Palimpsest, right? right? And I don't think the Sena Palimpsest okay. is based upon the Othmanic. So I think that they're deriving from some sort of so common you, source. Would you be with? I think Shadi Nasser likes to use the phrase pluriform that the Quran was sort of yeah, a pluriform text. Yeah, I early. think clearly was. Uh, I mean. One of the problems is, is be, so what happened before the Othmanic codification, or let's say the, the mid seventh century codification in my view is when it happened. Mm -hmm. um, what happened before that is more or less a black box with the exception of the Senat Palimpsest, right? And uh, when, when it comes to material evidence, we have these literary accounts, right? Um, but we really don't find any, really, any overlap between them and uh, and what we find in the manuscript? In the manuscript. This was right. for me when all these manuscripts became available. Um, what I thought I was going to find when I started looking at these early manuscripts is, I I thought that I was going to find all of this kind of textual variance that we find preserved in Sunni sources, right? Right. Um, you and sort of map maybe one even onto some the in the Shiite sources as well, I th though I thought those were less likely. Um, and more or less, they're not there. Um, and so it does make you wonder, like, are these literary sources hallucinating <laughs> these things? Right. And why would right. they? And what, all sorts of other things like this. Um, and so it is it is striking how, how uniform they are. But um, OK, yeah. OK. Well, these are complicated questions, yeah. sensitive. Uh, questions and obviously we're speaking as uh, historians and theologians you know uh, even in the 
context of biblical studies, mm -hmm. for example, you know, theologians have ways of thinking about sort of the community, what they call canonical criticism, mm -hmm. and it, the community ultimately has authority mm -hmm. uh, to discern what is revealed, yeah. what is inspired, etc. So there are theological ways of doing this. Um, but historians do what historians do. I remember, uh, I think it's a, the Tom Holland uh, documentary. I know, did you ever see that? Uh, he did and about... Alice of Pars. Uh, yeah, yeah, Islam, the untold story. Yeah, yeah. Provocatively titled. Mm -hmm. And he has, um, I think he asked a question of Fred Donner or something. Oh, I can't remember exactly, but he, I think he asked Professor Donner something like, um, okay, so if the traditional story uh, has complications or uncertainties... Um, what can you say about it? And Professor Donner says something like, well, there's only so much we can know. We can't really, mm -hmm. you know, there's no way to go further. Yeah. And then the film sort of cuts to Patricia Crona, <laughs> and she says something like, uh, well, you do what historians do. <laughs> like, you do more work, <laughs> yeah. and you find out what really happened. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, um, uh, I wanted to ask about a couple of these figures, actually. Yeah. So this is my segue to get to some of these figures uh, in Quranic studies. Um, did you know Patricia Cron? So I did, um, not as well as I knew Donner, because I, I specifically took classes with uh, Professor Donner okay. at U Chicago. Okay. And I met Patricia a couple of times while I was a grad student, and I spent half a year on a fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Studies in uh, Princeton. and interacted with her a lot there right. and talked right. a lot. That was her, the home for the second half of her career, or much of her career yeah, yeah. was at Princeton. Uh, yeah. However, that semester was also um, very difficult for her because she, uh, her cancer was at a quite an advanced stage at okay. that time. Okay. Um, but she still, I mean, she still, I mean, her commitment to other scholars and even her commitment to her role there at the Institute was you know, extraordinary, even while she was fighting uh, cancer. Um, yeah, and she still, like, we would present our research, and she would still give feedback. And okay. uh, I presented earlier versions of the chapters of my book on the Prophet Muhammad um, and benefited immensely from discussions with her and things like that. Um, yeah, so I, I do I do know of them both, but I know Donner better than I would say I know. Right, Patricia, because your PhD yeah. was, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think your advisor was with Dada Qadi, is that right? That's right. That's but right. you worked with Professor Donner yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, just on Krona, I mean, I see lots of comments on this uh, yeah. YouTube channel about uh, sort of nefarious yeah. Orientalists and things. That's <laughs> yeah. there. There's a lot of that. Yeah. And Krona was sort of would represent that to many people. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, what do you think about that? These accusations <laughs> against uh, that there's a larger project. I mean, this kind of the legacy of Edward Said is kind of yeah. behind this. Uh, that you know, nothing is innocent. Nothing. This historical work is not innocent. Yeah. Uh, you can't pretend that it's innocent. Yeah. Uh, it is somehow an accomplice to this larger Orientalist, maybe colonialist project. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I go back and forth on a lot of this. Um, you know, I. I, so Said was one of my you know, earliest influences I, okay. in my thought as a grad student in general. Because okay. uh, I read him very early on. I read him as an undergraduate first. And over the I last over 20 years since I've been like doing this stuff, I have changed my opinion on him maybe like a kajillion times. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, but I think fundamentally his book still has – insights that um, or, or more or less irrefutable, regardless of how granular you want to get and nitpick his book and things like that. Um, and I, I do still see its, its relevance. However, I don't think for him Orientalist is used really the way that is used by most people in a, in a vernacular term. And that okay. is, especially when it applied to someone like Patricia Krona, um, and that is this idea of a learned enemy of Islam. Right. To me, this is a very old usage that goes way before Saeed. Um, and, you know, I don't think that is the case. I don't think that's the case for most of Orientalist scholarship in its history. I think that for the broad sweep of Orientalist scholarship, it has taken place, yes, at the same time as empire, but also before, well, 
I should say not just empire, but rather colonialism. But I think also is, it took place when both Muslim and Islamic imperial projects and European imperial ambitions were more or less at, at parity okay. um, as well. Okay. And um, yeah, it's a legacy. It's, it's a real legacy that we have to, I'm, I feel like I'm not being very articulate here, but I, I think that it is... I mean, if I can jump yeah. in, there, there, are, there are clearly so-called Orientalists who, uh, I mean, were sort of worked in the colonial context. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess Nuka Grenier would be one. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if he was actually in what is now Indonesia yeah. for the Dutch. Um, uh, maybe Hamilton Gibb, is that right? Was yeah, he Hamilton in British Gibbs India? Example, yeah. um, there's a guy named Muir who I think was in British India. Uh, there's some people who would comfortably call themselves missionaries mm -hmm. who wrote about Islam, like Samuel yeah, yeah. Vamer, who was mm -hmm. in uh, the Arabian Peninsula and Egypt. So, um, but, uh, I mean, a, a counterpoint would be, uh, there's a lot of diversity among these folks. Like, yeah. they were attacking each other. Um, some of them were sort of ex-Christians. I mean, even uh, some of the earlier folks who wrote in Islam that people might know yeah. Uh, not know that wrote on Islam, Edward Gibbon. Yeah. And many uh, of them convert as well. Um, to it, Islam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's many Orientals that convert as well. Yes. Um, so it's just, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it seems like a generalization. Yeah. I mean, that Said ultimately, yeah. uh, whether, in, in, whether or not he intended it, but yeah. that's the effect. Yeah. I think for Said, it, he has multiple definitions of Orientalism. Um, and one of them is just, you're an academic that studies the East in any right. way whatsoever. Right. So you're an Orientalist if you do political economy of the Middle East and you work in a Western institution. Congratulations, right? Uh, you are an Orientalist if you study kind of modern Arabic literature uh, from a Western institution and things like this. Um, and you're, of course, an Orientalist if you are an Orientalist in the traditional sense, like you are a philologist. You study yeah. the history yeah. of the languages, the cultures, and the literatures of you know, people that are. So you would say not in that like case, Latin. if someone's like editing texts, like my uh, doctoral advisor yeah. edited a lot of texts, Gerhard Bervering. Yeah, he's, a, he's editing Arabic texts uh, or Persian texts. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, is that, that presumably is not part of some nefarious project? Yeah, I mean, that's just somehow... orient, Orientalist philology, right? Okay. And, okay. and it's, this has more or less been done in collaboration with. Um, people in the Middle East and also you, you it's being it, done yeah. a lot more by <laughs> yeah, this exactly. one. Yeah. <laughs> you edited this one. We'll get back to that. But it's also done the, that basic sort of philological work is done a lot more in the region than it is outside yes. the region. Yes. I mean, the, the by far the lion's share, probably the whole pride share of that type of work yeah. is now done within the region rather than outside it. Right. Um, but um, so there's there's that. But I think Said's other understandings of Orientalism and is the idea that one, there is this ontological, that is fundamental, essential difference between two spheres, the East and the West, and never shall the twain meet. That's a fundamental problem, right? And that still remains with us in a more popular vernacular level. Okay. Okay. And then also the idea of uh, creating an expert class whose knowledge is more authentic and crowds out. Um, sort of the voices of people from the region, um, and that there this kind of expert class of knowledge and discourse really is point. used by elites to dominate right uh, the region and to de determine their political, their economic, and their kind of cultural future uh, without their consent. Uh, and I, uh, to me, that's a very real phenomenon. Mm. I personally, I feel extremely distant from that. Working at my like little desk in Ohio, I have no connections with any branch of the, I mean, I work for the Ohio state government as far as I, I'm a civic employee and I have okay. a, a civic uh, pension and things like this, a uh, state pension. Uh, but yeah, you know, I have no contact with the foreign policy establishment or, or anything like that. Um, but those sorts of phenomena are real. And I would say someone like Gibb really did what really was a figure that would lean very strongly into that. Okay. Trying to marry kind of the traditional oriental, uh, list philology, philological approach with a more social sciences approach in, in the United States in order to create kind of a epistocracy with inside the American government, like this uh, uh, kind of expert class that will set and determine yeah. U.S. policy yeah. in the region and things yeah, like that. Yeah, and there are probably other characters yeah. 
who had a different sort of, I don't know, M.O. Yeah. Uh, in their writings about the Islamic world. I'm yeah. thinking of Richard Burton. Yeah. Maybe Edward uh, Lane. I think Richard Burton is a fraud. I have talked to you. This okay. I, uh, but he's, okay. he is like a, a typical Victorian. Uh, yeah, I mean, ex- what he's ex- trying to sell books maybe ultimately. Yeah, yeah. It's part of entertainment yeah. and yeah. book selling. And yeah. he's, I mean, he's a really interesting, <laughs> he's just such a weird figure uh, because he can sit for – for those who yeah. don't know, Richard Burton translated yeah. partially, I think. Yeah, the so-called, so-called, yeah, the so-called Arabian, the so-called Arabian Nights. Yeah. Also, uh, but he covertly, it with, supposedly, yeah. went on a pilgrimage to Mecca and yeah. Medina. Yeah, he did and, that when he was younger. So, and his okay. translation of the Arabian Nights is extraordinary because he, he kind of lards it with these insane footnotes that are absolutely unhinged. Um, and really, what he was trying to do, believe it or not, is elevate the knights to pornography status uh and he had more or less achieved it i think that his version of the arabian nights is um <laughs> one of the reasons why the word pornography e- entered the english language and was his legal regime his of, translation uh, like regulating pornography in, in the uk and then of course elsewhere after that was because of his translation of the knights whereas beforehand it was largely seen as as pretty banal kind of children literature or, or popular folklore and stuff like that. Anyway, he's a, he's another <laughs> character to get another on to. Another case yeah. entirely. Okay, yeah. let me ask you about a few more uh, a few more characters in chronic studies and then we'll take we'll take a break. Uh, Fred Donner you mentioned uh, you, you know very well. I do want to say a word about Muhammad and the Believers, uh, that book. Yeah. Uh, um, so I don't want to put you on the spot because yeah, no, you're no, an no, advisor. Yeah. So, so yeah. you don't have to give thumbs up or thumbs down. <laughs> no, no. It's a thought I mean, or two. You know, so sorry, he's not your I'm, advisor, but he was yeah, one yeah. of the people yeah, involved yeah, in your Yeah, no, I mean, I still that's like a to me that's one of the the most compelling and and readable accounts of the early Islamic period that exists, um, and it opened up I think two of the most important debates that are still going on today. And number one, I would say, how did early Muslim identity as a religious identity form? How quickly did it form? And was there a possibility that Christians and Jews were part of the early mm-hmm. Islamic conquest mm-hmm. movement as well? Mm-hmm. Uh, people to respond to that thesis and that one of those, the, the, the two I'm going to mention, sort of that particular thesis in, in various ways, um, where I'm much more inclined to Jewish openness to the early Islamic conquest than I am to the Christian ones, but it's, it's a very compelling argument mm-hmm. all the same. And in order to do that argument, he revived something, and, and Prisha did this too, which was a very important move, and that is to put the Quran back in front and center as being our our main source that we use to right. start thinking about right. early Islam. Along with the Constitution of Medina. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's important also for exactly. his argument. But, uh, and yeah. the other question I would say that he that he raises uh, that I'm still trying to figure out is, is when did Arab identity coalesce? Okay. When did Arabness become important okay. for the early Islam period? Was it uh, that it was that it already coalesced in the pre-Islam period? He definitely would say no. He thinks Arab identity is is a much later thing. And the early for him, they're the Islamic conquest, not the Arab conquest. And I think that yeah. he set the tone and he framed I think two of the biggest questions of uh, of our generation right now in terms of the histori- historiography yeah, yeah. of the early Islamic conquest and yeah. early Islam in general. And, Interesting yeah. that he makes a case that religion really matters. Yeah. And I think that maybe, I, I don't, I'm not trained as a historian, mm. but I think that may be a reaction in part against the trend for a couple of decades yeah. of sort of putting religion on the side yeah, of things yeah. and looking for, I don't know, social economic yeah. motivation for yeah. things. Um, Okay, Andrew Rippon. Did you know Andrew Rippon? I didn't know him at all, actually, unfortunately. Okay. I never even met him in person, believe it or okay, not. Okay. I met him on the page, but never face-to-face. Yes. Face. How about uh, Mahmoud Ayoub? Never met him either. Okay. Yeah. Uh, these are two, <laughs> two great... anti two, <laughs> <laughs> two greats who have, who have left us. Uh, yeah, I met Mahmoud Ayoub. Uh, he graciously invited me to his apartment mm-hmm. in uh, Beirut mm-hmm. uh, maybe 20 years ago. You know, he's originally Lebanese yeah. and came to the U.S., taught at Temple University, Hartford Seminary. Um, so one of the most impressive people I've ever met. Uh, Nasser Hamad Abu Zaid. Never met him either. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, th- how about a word or two about Wadad Qadi? You mentioned <laughs> she was your advisor. Oh, yeah. Wadad Qadi, I mean, yeah, she's a lodestar. Like, she's she's the person that um, 
is definitely the most formative influence upon me, uh, my scholarship, and and things like that. Cause one, it started off with me in one of my first grad grad school papers handing in to her. She just absolutely demolished. I mean, totally demolished it. And being a prideful young man at the time, I was like, this is ridiculous and blah, blah, blah. And it's very smartly, I asked one of my friends, who's a professor at the AUB right now, his name's Lyle Armstrong. I was like, we look at this, my paper, and think if she's being unfair. And because Lyle is a person, of, or I should say Professor Armstrong, is a person of incredible integrity. He really is. Okay. He read it, and he said, she's 100% right on. Every criticism she made of your paper is, is 100% right okay. on, man. Okay. <laughs> and so I was like, well, that's humbling. And uh, at that moment, I decided, I was like, the next thing I hand in to her, I want her to be like, I want you to publish this. That was my goal. I wanted to hand something in to her so good that, that she would do that. And yeah, so, yeah. and she, and that was actually my first published article. Okay. Um, uh, I handed it in to her and she did. So in any case, she, she's a, an advisor that is extremely uh, dedicated to the students that she advised. Uh, and to the extent where I was embarrassed to do poor work for her because I knew how much of her own effort and insight and things yes. like that, that she would yes. give in return. And so I wanted to give her the best that I could because I knew she would always give me the best that she had to offer. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very, very fond of Professor Clark. Okay. Yeah. Maybe one, one last name. Yeah. Muhammad Abdul Halim wrote the foreword to your, uh, this, yeah. you mentioned this before. Uh, the forward to this, uh, Mama Ibn Rashid will speak about mm -hmm. this maybe in a little bit. Um, did you get to meet him in person? So or? I've met him briefly only at the SOAS Quran conference. Okay, okay. Uh, but, so um, he held, yeah, this regular conference yeah, at yeah. the School of Oriental and African Studies I don't, I don't in think London. I not have it anymore, do they? I haven't heard of I it in a while. Yeah, um, yeah. But anyway, and also, like, in terms of, that's my favorite Quran translation. I always use it. I think that's the one that's the most yes, readable. Yes. I mean, maybe it's a little bit uh, Bakhardin Razi for people. If, I, I don't know. If, for those of you who don't know, he's a very important uh, Muslim polymath, and his tafsir is, is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But to me, it's it's a very faithful, readable um, translation, uh, readable in English. And uh, it doesn't pull any – it doesn't do any funny but business. <laughs> I mean, it's it's – Specifically, like Sunni Muslim translation, of course. Uh, but I just I find it to be very good. It's my yeah. favorite one. Great, great. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll get into Quran translations yeah. as well. But let's let's take a break, yeah. and uh, we'll see everyone uh, after the break. Okay.